Uh, okay, so no more questions. Uh, let's just do a little review. Um, uh, let's see. I, I, so I kind of I, I started on one thing that I realized I needed to start here instead. Remind you of what um, that we're doing multi-electron wave functions, and because hydrogen atom is nice because actually it's horrible, but anyway. <laughs> The hydrogen atom has an analytical solution, right? So I know what all the wave functions are. I know exactly what the energy is. Wave functions like 1s are e to the minus r, and they get a little more complicated. Nodes here, sine theta there, right? So we have them all down. We know what the energies are. Um, remember that one of the most difficult things about hydrogen atom is you got one. The thing you want to keep straight is 1s state. Then you got a 2s and a 2p. Those are degenerate. And you got a 3s, a 3p, a 3d. You look, you had it in high school, but I'm, I'm kind of surprised that sometimes people still get that kind of messed up in your head. Remember that that comes about from um, solutions and subsolutions to the Schrodinger equation as you do the whole separability thing, and we've done that at ad nauseum. Okay, so once you add an electron, everything turns to positive. So if I'm talking H minus or even helium, everything changes. It's unfortunately not solvable because of the Coulomb interaction. Again, I'm just reviewing. And so, wow. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what the nature of the solutions are. Right now, you may be thinking like um, the, the wave functions, let's say for helium. So the 1s is the same as the 1s of hydrogen. Um, with, with, there's actually a little change because the nucleus is more charged, but that's an easy, easy fix. Um, yes, but there's more to it than that. Anyway, I'll tell you a little bit more about how like 1s, uh, 2s, 2p are different for like helium versus hydrogen. And I'll talk just a briefly about that at the end of the class. The major thing though is this anti-symmetry deal. This anti-symmetric with respect to interchange, which is called the poly, a poly exclusion principle, uh, is that you, now you, again, you, you should have had this in freshman, you can't have two two electrons in the same state at the same time, and that would mean this. You have a 1s state with two electrons and they're both spin up. Now, again, you, you learn it's like a little simple, almost childlike puzzle of adding electrons via the alpha-bow principle, one's up, one's down, it, great, and, um, and that's because you can't have two spin up at the same time that violates poly exclusion. Okay, so now the implications of that for, um, yeah, and this guy, this guy is fine. What you do to make that real in multi-electron wave function quantum mechanics is you design your wave functions to be, to be anti-symmetric to interchange and that has the effect of causing a mistaken configuration to actually be zero. So again, this property, if applied to this no, 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 no state, will result in a wave function that's actually zero, which it's like prevents you from messing up. I don't know why that works the way that that does, but regardless, okay. Now also recall the thing that slays me is that this is the one time I see something that I can't put in terms of a physical uh, description. Like, like when we're integrating minus pressure times volume, right? remember work, I can tell you that's like letting gas into a vacuum chamber or, or filling a hole. I mean, it's all, right, it's very visualizable. This is not. I have no idea what the heck this, if this means anything, I don't know what it is. Um, now recall that, uh, now, now here we see, uh, so maybe, maybe, oh, I'm drawing a singlet, so let's call it, let's call it this guy right here. Not that one, but this one. So this is electron one in a one S state, this is electron two in a one S state, and what this means is, I'm erasing, I write all this out, and everywhere I see a one, I erase it and write a two, and everywhere I see a two on, on, on these guys, I write a one. Now, not, not the wave functions, uh, because a one S state is still a one S state, so that, if you get confused about how that works, uh, you wouldn't change the orbitals, because then that's like a different atom, that doesn't make sense. You're, you're exchanging the labels on the coordinates, which is how you identify the electrons. Now, I, I'm, kinda, I'm hoping you don't have a hard time remembering that. I'm sure that's going to be on the third test. I haven't written it yet. The thing that I have a hard time with that is that it's weird and it doesn't make sense. But it has to be true that when you do it, you get this. And, and I, I don't get this, but I do get this. I do get that if I write out, if, if I follow this, 
this program, then I write zero wave functions when I screw up, and that sounds useful. All right, now I also have to do a little confessing here. Uh, you know that I never, to a fault, I always try to tell you that I never like to simplify things. Not, we do it all the time when you're a freshman, or God knows in high school, or like in elementary school. Pocahontas married John Smith, right? Remember that story? She married Captain John Smith. She didn't. She married John Wolfe, who was a farmer. You guys you don't know any history anyway. All right, never mind. <laughs> Road of Colony, all that stuff. Anyway, uh, so we lie to kids. We also lie to you as freshmen. And, um, and I try not to ever do that, but I did try the other day, and then you saw me screw up. Um, so when it comes to anti-symmetry, this works. We have a symmetric uh, space, so I, I'm going to start using particular language to so get used to this. This is the space part, this is the spin part, and that's not that hard to understand, right? And the clever thing is, when you have spin up and spin down, um, that's what describes a singlet state, and the reason it's called a singlet um, is because if you add up, if you add up, add up all the S's, and that means uh, one half uh, plus minus one half h bar. And I'm talking about the up and down, you get zero. And recall how, you remember how uh, uh, when we were talking about rotation, when we were talking about like P states, how uh, a P has an L of one, and then we have a PX and a PY and a PZ. So we've got sub-quantum numbers. We've got M of minus, minus L, minus one, zero to one. And the, the, the degeneracy was two L, yeah, 2L plus 1, remember that? So if I have an L of 0, that's singlet, 2L plus 1 is 1, so it's non-degenerate. If I'm talking about a triplet, L is, sorry, let's see, L of 0 is an S state, and it's non-degenerate. L of 1 has 2L plus 1, 3 P states, so that is, that's triply degenerate. So the reason, the, the word, where we get the word singlet is if I take 2S plus 1, that's the degeneracy, of the spin wave function, I get one for singlet. Only one, one singlet. That's literally where we get the word. Just wanted to point that out. By the way, triplets, when we're covering today's lecture, is all about triplets. Guess what? Two times one plus one is three. Right. Anyway, so we're getting there. I'm jumping ahead, shouldn't do that. All right, anyway. So, um, so singlets, a uh, little bit I didn't say. Um, okay, so singlets, because it's spin up and spin down, and I just told you a little bit about why we, we literally use the word singlet because there's only one state because it's singly degenerate. A little aside there. Because it's spin up and spin down, it's easy to create an anti-symmetric to interchange. This is called anti-symmetry to interchange. It's easy to create an anti-symmetric to interchange spin wave function. And hey, all my problems are solved. Uh, and it's not hard, you do it on your homework if you, again, don't do that with the wave functions, do it with the coordinates. So erase that one, put a two, erase that two, put a one, erase that one, put a two, da 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 da, and you will pick up a minus sign. And I showed you that last time, you're also doing it on your homework. Now, I want, although, although this isn't hard at all, and I would probably have it on the cheat sheet, you don't have to memorize this stuff. You really want to do it with what's called a Slater determinant. You don't have to remember that word, Slater. It's, again, my advisor's advisor is kind of cool. But, um, um, and of course, the way you do that is, um, here's an aside. I kind of forgot an aside, right? Uh, a, B, C, D, in case you forgot. So there's a matrix. The determinant has that little symbology, and that's A, D, minus C, D. Um, if you do that, this guy times that guy minus that guy times that guy is equals that. Uh, now, the reason that, I, I mean, it's like, well, which one should I remember? I mean, this, this really just is hard, right? The reason you want to remember this is when you go to three electrons. So when I say anti-symmetric to interchange, this is something that's always slayed me about math classes, especially in physical math classes like this one. It's easy to see when I do, when I have two electrons, and I'm talking about switching two things, it's set up to be as easy as possible, right? I mean, again, this is, this is like middle school easy. What happens when you have three electrons? 
right? Well, I mean, what does it even mean? Do you switch all three at once? Well, guess what? I mean, how do you do that? I mean, I switch one with three or one with two, and, and then, then which one do I switch three with, right? It's, it's weird and confusing. So I, I hate it sometimes when I see a simple description and then apply it to an example that's, so, that's set up to be easy to have massive confusion when you change it in a kind of an obvious way, like adding a third electron. So the reason that you want to do it this way is that when you add a third electron, and if you don't know yet, it's on your homework, you, you simply add another row and another column. And you can see here that the way that this game works, this uh, way, this way is for the electron, and this way is for the wave function. So you see that the electron goes from one to two as you go from left to right, but the wave function goes from like uh, the first one to the second one, and the spins change as you go down. So, so this changes the wave function, this tells you which electron you're talking about. So when you apply that to three electrons, it's really easy to set up the matrix. You just keep adding electrons or you keep adding the orbitals. There. It's unbelievably easy. Um, and then I show you how to do a determinant of a three by three, and, and, and there you go. And then you're going to write it all out and then show that if you interchange any two electrons, you get a minus sign. So that's on your homework, so I'm not going to talk about it in class. Um, it's algebraically, it's not difficult, it's just it is algebraically difficult. So anyway, so Slater determinants give you this thing. Um, the reason is, is that when you get more electrons, it's way easier to keep straight how to, help it, how to do this right. Okay, now where I screwed up the last time, ah, I burned myself on this. All right, so to tell the honest truth, I was going to say to you that this is how to do it, and that's not true. I was planning on lying and not telling you that reality is actually like this. Okay, so this does not matter. I, I just so so I kind of screwed up, and I told you this is that this was equal to this and not that. It's just look, end of the day, tired. Okay, so let me tell you how this really works, and then we won't bring it up again because it's just way too complicated. It turns out that aside from this anti-symmetry uh, principle, this poly exclusion principle deal, there's an indistinguishability deal. Uh, so. Imagine if I was talking about a singlet state. Let's say I was doing a singlet state like this. Uh, that's a, what, I did, what I had there was a singlet state, but this is a singlet state too. Every spin up has a spin down. It's, it's that easy. Okay. Um, if I wrote, if, if this was like, if psi 1 was the 1s and psi 2 was the 2s, if you leave it this way, it means that you, that you can like color the first electron blue and number 2 red and always see that the blue electrons in the 1s and the red electrons in the 2s. But that's nonsense, right? If you're thinking like, well, how do you paint an electron? Good, no, you cannot paint an electron. That is ridiculous, right? That's something to tell a very small child. If you can't distinguish them by some way of like, like what I just described, if you cannot distinguish them, then you can't write them in some way that is distinguishable, which is what this is accomplishing. So the trick is, is that you make a symmetric part, you make the, um, the space part, remember space part, spin part, you make the space part, you permute the labels and still make it symmetric and of course the anti-symmetry is still in the spin. Okay, so I actually was planning on hiding that because it just doesn't matter, but I screwed up and told you, so there it is, is that. Okay, now the way, one reason that I, I normally just don't mention this is for one, it just doesn't really matter, this is still symmetric, this is anti-symmetric. Um, the way you deal with it in terms of a, um, in terms of a uh, determinant, you actually have to write, you actually have to write a uh, two. It's the, I can't remember, it's the, the difference. And it's the difference of two determinants. So basically it's this one minus, um, just, just so it's not so visually messed up, it's, um, this one minus another one where you, where you switch the R1s and the sine ones um, anyway. And so that's how you actually have to write it out. So anyway, um, kind of burned that I messed that up. Uh, so again, I, I, I don't want to at times complicate things to the point where you like kind of just tune out and say, I, you know, I'm done. Um, not, not too bad, right? Okay, so anyway, any questions on singlets?
we're okay. Wait, so uh, which way do you want it to do it? The actual way? Oh, let's, the uh, no, let's just worry about the top one. Yeah, because this one just, it's, it's not important. And um, in, in terms of like, which way do I want you to do it? Well, it depends on what's the test. <laughs> okay. so, so on the homework, on the homework I have you analyzing three electrons because uh, I'm going to show you the triplet, so I'm kind of showing you everything. So for it to stick in your head, and again, you know, there's, in my own education, there's been so many times where I see an example and it's like really easy, but then you just like change an X to a Y and all of a sudden it's like you have no idea what to do and the example just don't work. It drives me crazy. So, so on the homework I have you do three electrons and unfortunately algebraically quite complicated and that's what I had to do on the homework. Algebraically quite complicated, but it totally sticks in your head how to do this for, for you know, four or five electrons. It, it's kind of obvious at that point. Okay, so that's it. Those are singlets. Now, singlets are always, uh, singlets are almost universally ground states. Uh, so, let me just write this out again. Hydrogen atom. Um, hydrogen anion is, is a, or helium, right? 2s, and then there's, then there's 2p's. Um, 3s, right? Okay, so if I have a uh, 3p's, 3d's, anyway, if I have a helium atom, an H minus atom, this is the ground state. So we find that um, ground states that are not singlet are shockingly rare. Usually you find them in metals. There's only two or three known organic examples of non-singlet ground states. But where triplets become very important is that things don't always stay in the ground state. Uh, they can get to the excited state, and guess how you do that? Light. Light tends to promote electrons. If it has the right energy, you did that in your little homework um, last one, or the one before, the last one. And of course, if light has enough energy, uh oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, no, I broke the selection rule. That has to go to a 2p state, but regardless, okay, so there we go. Now that's an excited state singlet. Um, but what I'm about to show you is that actually these can turn into triplets. These can turn into triplets. And the reason that's important is because, uh, okay, what last, this is this I always put, I put this to grad students. What lasts longer, a mountain or the trees on the mountain? They're obvious. The mountain's the mountain. Right, and the trees, right? The trees will degrade due to oxygen. Not, 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 let's say they live forever, right? They could live forever. Oxygen gets to them eventually, right? Uh, oxygen is why, you know you have brighteners in your clothes. Well, 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 why? I mean, they come with brighteners. So why do you add more brighteners via laundry detergent? Because those brighteners bleach. Why do things bleach? That's why. Oxidation. Oxidation happens. Oxidation is incredibly destructive. It's why everything eventually breaks down in this world full of oxygen. Too bad we need oxygen, but anyway. So forming triplet states. Triplet states are very important because this is how everything ultimately degrades via oxidation. I'll explain that in a little bit, but now what I really want to do is just write the wave functions for triplets. And to do a triplet, um, sorry, where am I at? my own notes um, uh, to do a triplet. Okay, so it turns out that, all right, so let, let me put this you know, break here, triplet. Okay, to do a triplet, let me, um, let me do this. Let me say that I have a 1s or a 2s. Uh, let's do a triplet state. So that would be like that. And so uh, that would be alpha. Alpha 1, alpha 2. Okay, now I have a problem already. Remember that I created anti-symmetric spin wave functions for singlets because it was easy. It was an easy way to get out of that anti-symmetry trap. I had to write the thing anti-symmetric. And so I just inserted that property into the spin wave functions. That was because I had an alpha beta. You can't do that if you have alpha alpha. Uh, oh, also, you know, what I call up and down is a human convention. Uh, I also have this possibility. 
Uh, so I've got spin down. So I've got a couple things going on here. For one, I'm clearly a uh, question. Yeah, what makes it a triplet? Uh, the, the spins are, so, so remember, um, so singlets, singlets, um, all right, so this is a triplet, so I remember I turned a singlet to a triplet. Um, spin up, spin up, right? You know, singlets were spin up, spin down, right? So um, let's, let's see what S is, right? So I've got one half H, um, I've got one half H bar plus, plus one half. Now notice I'm, I'm doing this plus, plus one half H bar because it could have been plus minus half H bar, which is, um, which is what I had for a singlet, which gave me zero. And notice that 2s plus 1, which is the degeneracy, is the number 3. So triplet 3. We have three states. Three degeneracies. Where are they? Okay, now again, if I'm describing, um, if I'm describing a triplet, um, so I've drawn a little triplet state that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't reach with light, but whatever. Um, it's still fine. Um, I've got one, I have alpha, alpha, beta, beta, so I should actually have a third, right? So I have three ways to write these triplet wave functions. So two things, so I'm going to write that out, but I also, most importantly, I want to point out that I am robbed of the ability to put the anti-symmetry into the spin part. I can't say alpha 1, alpha 2, minus alpha 2, alpha 1. That's zero, right? That doesn't work. So I've got myself a, a trap here coming. Um, and also, I need to have three of these. Now, uh, up, up, down, down, that's incredibly obvious. Okay, now, this is very painful. I do not understand this. I have no ability to understand this. I've never understood this, but let me give you the third. And this makes me want to throw up. Here's a singlet, right? Half plus minus half, zero. Add in the same damn thing where the spins are, are flipped. And this is, <laughs> oh God, um, alpha one beta two plus alpha two, um, al yeah, alpha two beta one. That works. I, I, you know, I, could, I could either switch the ones or twos, the alpha and beta, it's, it's, it's completely irrelevant which one I pick. But so the first one is up, then the first one is down, the second one is down, and the, um, then the first, wait a minute, what? Uh, yeah, 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 that second one's up, and the first one is down. Yeah, there you go. Again, it's kind of arbitrary how you do this. Okay, two singlets added together becomes a triplet. <laughs> I don't, I don't know why. I do not understand this, it drives me nuts. I just do not understand this, but anyway, these two totally make sense, but there has to be three, and that's the third. All right, anyway. Okay, so, huh? I know, remember, the important thing is, you know that a singlet has things pa paired. They're usually, they're, they're ground states. It's incredibly rare not to see a singlet ground state because of the way we like to add electrons. Triplets are gonna happen in the excited state. So I shine light on this one. I, I moved it over to this orbital for this little example to show you the degeneracies. And now I've got to show you how to write the wave functions, knowing that I've got a problem with anti-symmetry when it comes to spin. And the answer is, do not try to make the spin anti-symmetric. You utterly cannot. You make the space part anti-symmetric. So the way that looks is, so now the, now the uh, wave function, the space part of the wave function is anti-symmetric. Um, I'm probably forgetting the square root of two a bunch of times because again, that's never really that important. It'll it'll pop out in normalization. When you see what we're doing, it's like we're like constructing these, right? We're constructing them. So if I can write out the proper anti-symmetric wave function, I always am obliged to normalize it. So these little square roots of two will um, not be important if I miss, uh, make a mistake. Okay, so the way this will work is I've got um, psi one r one. Uh, psi 2. Now being generic, of course, so like in, in this example, that's a 1s and that's a 2s. Uh, but I, I'm just giving them these arbitrary labels here um, to genericize it. And of course you can imagine that the anti-symmetry just has minus, right? A minus anti is going to imply that word implies a minus 
And then I switch the labels. I switch the labels on the electron. So it was relatively trivial. And um, then you multiply by the wave functions. And unlike the um, singlets, um, I, I have to write. I have to. <laughs> I wrote the letter number three. I have to. I have to come up with three ways to do this. And again, that's not. It's not exactly difficult. Alpha one, beta two, plus alpha two, beta one. Okay, so three different spin wave functions. Now I can tell you practically uh, if. You know, we're on the edge of where you're ready for grad school stuff because this is your last class and if you stay on, you go to grad school and if you become a theoretician, then this is the kind of stuff you do. It turns out that if you're seriously like writing programs to do these kind of analyses, you just use alpha alpha every time. It's just easier. Don't do this one. It, it's, it just requires more work. Um, now, why does it matter? It turns out that in a magnetic field, then it matters. If you have a magnetic field that's pointed up, then let's see, that would be in a, a north pointed north, which is bad. So that would that would be high energy. This would be low energy. Remember that magnet's like the anti pair, right? You you have a north north south is good, right? So that would be high energy. That'd be low energy. That would be affected. So uh, again, the, the reason that theoreticians might need to actually work on all three is if you're trying to describe uh, the quantum mechanics of the magnetic field, which um, if that sounds a little like, whoa, yeah, it is. It's, it's actually kind of difficult. Uh, let's see. Uh, now what do I want to say? Um, OK, OK, so there's not much to do here. Oh, this, this of course, can be put in a, in a Slater determinant. So as a determinant, um, it's just as easy to understand. Uh, I've got psi 1, r1, alpha 1. So, so this, this, again, this is very simple. Uh, so I've got to remember that the electrons, OK, same, got wave functions change as you go down. It's, a little confusing because they're both alpha. It's a little easier when I can see them both change. All right, if I go right, the wave functions are the same. It's the number of electrons that changes. There we go. OK, I got that right. And then this guy has the first electron in the first orbital. This one has the second electron in the second orbital, which makes a lot of sense. And again, uh, I'll just put a little bracket there. Oh, and, and to be, I have to do this perfectly. It must be done perfectly. Okay, uh, the, one over the square root of two of the determinant of, of that matrix. So there you go. It's actually kind of easy, right? Um, now, here's the thing. I, I don't have much else to say about this. I know it's a little bit like, uh, so I'm going to have you work on this on your homework. The, the whole, whole, almost all of the homework, except for one question, is just doing this over and over again so you get used to it. Uh, I, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the consequences of having anti-symmetric wave functions. So as much as this is like this weird rule that keeps you from writing an impossible configuration, it does something extra. And this is, this is really bizarre. And to understand that, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, do an expectation value of energy. So I'm going to apply this to the Hamiltonian. With all these terms, all the Hamiltonians' terms, and then we're going to integrate the whole thing. Actually, in the world, that's way too painful. But I can, I'm just basically going to you know, set it up and show you the end. There's something very strange that's going to happen when we do that. And let me point out where, where this originates is. So when we look at this determinant, I see that electron 1 is in the first orbital and electron 2 is in the second orbital. That is totally sensible. Of course, one electron's in one orbital and the second electron's in the second orbital. These cross terms are weird. This has the, second elect uh, the, the first electron in the second orbital and the second electron in the first orbital. So they've exchanged positions. And 
why would that happen, right? So remember, these are models of things that are real. And, and I can't, and unfortunately, again, as I told you many times, I have a very limited ability to make, to make this make sense. I'm like filling a hole when we're doing DV in, in DKIM 1. This is stating that the electrons are changing place. But that doesn't make sense yet. Let me show you what a consequence is here. So now I'm going to write out the Hamiltonian. And we're going to do an expectation value calculation as opposed to a uh, eigenvalue calculation. Now, of course, the wave functions are eigenvalues. Eigenfunctions. No, actually, they're not. You, you know, we actually have to, you know, you know just realize this. Just realize this right now. We actually cannot do eigenvalue equations with these because these are not eigenfunctions, right? Because uh, because we're enforcing we're forcing separate electrons in separate orbitals, but we can't because of the Coulomb operator. So we actually don't have. I mean, no one knows what the real wave functions are uh, for a multi-electron Hamiltonian because remember we have that unfortunate electron-electron coupling. And that means that you can't write the wave function separately, but, but we just don't know how not to do that. So, okay. Okay, so we have to do this. We have to do this. Uh, so, so the question is, what is the expectation value of energy? Which means Hamiltonian, wave function on the right, wave function on the left, integrate, integrate, integrate. Uh, where the Hamiltonian, of course, is... Um, I'm just going to write this down just because I can't get enough of it. It's, um, I, I don't know what I'll, you know what I'll do on the test? I'll probably write out one of these bigger ones like this one or the, or the full one for the hydrogen atom. And I'll say, hey, what does this part do? Uh, what does that part do? And, um, and I kind of like that because you could kind of figure it out even if you were just watching a video like 70% of the class is apparently elected to do. going to burn you. Uh, anyway, <laughs> and so I might do something like that. So uh, remember that, um, so I'll put this as, as the absolute value. Usually I write it this way. Uh, and, and so you often see this expressed as R12. So I might, I, I'm saying that because I might do it. It's usually written that way. Uh, so recall, God damn, look, oh, geez. Um, look at this. There's just two electrons. You know, most molecules have way more than two electrons, by the way. Um, this, this guy, this guy. Because of this, those wave functions I'm writing out, they're not the right wave functions. They are not eigenfunctions. So we have to do this the expectation value way. Remember that eigenfunctions are awesome, but your eigenfunctions better be eigenfunctions. If they're not, that doesn't work. This is the solution when you can't do that. Now, you know, hopefully you also recall the reason that that still works is because you can put your messed up, so your messed up wave functions, which aren't technically right, they can be put as, they can be expressed as the sum of wave functions that are okay with the Hamiltonian, even though we don't know what they are. Uh, recall that that's how we did, we broke apart things in terms of like momentum waves. That's how we calculated uh, that sine and cosine were stationary free waves. Anyway, hopefully you remember that. Okay, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. Okay, so that means that energy, of course, in case you forgot now, I'm putting down a double integral because there's two electrons. Uh, now remember that that double integral is, each, each integral is technically three integrals. So there's six, this is six integrals. God, this really does turn into a nightmare. I mean, people do this for a living, like they're plugging in Things almost the size of proteins. And they're doing this on, I mean, they are doing those on supercomputers, trust me. They probably have 100 or more electrons. Can you imagine how bad this gets? And then your wave function, too, with that giant determinant thing that. But anyway, anyway, anyway. Um, okay, so, so each integral is actually three integrals, uh, r theta phi, and then I have two electrons. Okay, so then I've got the complex conjugate. Not that, oh, oh, well, letter I does appear. Letter I does appear in case you've got a um, px and py, right, in the, in the theta part. Uh, so you do have to worry about complex conjugates, okay? Uh, and then we've got e tau 1. Now remember that 
I have to use shorthand when, it, when we get to this um, because, uh, again, I, I just don't want to write out six integrals because this guy, uh, this got the r1 squared, sine theta 1, the r theta, the uh, phi theta, whatever. Okay, um, all right, now, now again, you can imagine, I wanted to write this out to remind you what a hideous mess this is. Those wave functions are not a piece of cake. You've got the, the worst FOIL problem in the history of mankind. Then you've got three, six, in, six integrals for every one of those terms. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I'm not writing this out, no, no. So remember, uh, I actually had you do the Hamiltonian on hydrogen 1s, and you, and you actually calculated the right energy of the hydrogen atom. That ought to work. You, you can do that for 2s, 1s, whatever. I had you do 1s, and you were able to calculate the energy. You did it last homework and the homework before. Now I add another electron. Oh my god! I'm, looking, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to try this. I'm not going to put this on a homework or put this in a, in a, in a handout. That's nuts. Uh, anyway, so what you end up getting is this. You get, uh, because you can identify, although you do have a hideous mess, you can identify um, that there are parts uh, that come that, that contribute to the total and you get a kinetic energy part and that's easy so we're you know when you put wave function wave function integrate that's and when you do that with this one that's your kinetic energy uh, the coulomb part is here and here but this term this this is this is a weird guy here let me kind of separate that so it turns out you're going to get a plus component uh, oh, 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 plus, um, uh, let me see here, plus for singlet and minus for triplet. So when I say plus minus, uh, plus for singlet, minus for triplet, that usually tends to be the case, sometimes not, because again, you just heard me rattle and bray about how long these evaluations are. So anyway, okay, now what are the terms? Now kinetic energy, I'm, I'm not going to write that out, it's just these parts. Um, C is the Coulomb, and J is the exchange. And these are all from the um, uh, they, they all, they all, they, they all have a component of this guy in it. So Coulomb has this guy, this guy, and part of this guy, and the exchange has part of that guy. Now let me write that out so that's a bit more clear and you'll see it. Um, I'll write down the Coulomb and then the exchange integral. And, and the big picture here, big picture, is that what this is doing is this is changing the energy of the singlet relative to the triplet such that the triplet is almost universally lower in energy than the singlet. And that is why everything oxidizes. I'll explain that in just a moment. But, um, so, so big picture, this J thing, this J thing causes triplets to be lower in energy than singlets. It comes about from this anti-symmetry to wave functions. Now that is going to be easy to understand by looking at C versus J. So the Coulomb integral is, again, remember that this is um, from, th this is, this is you know, R theta V and all that jazz. I guess it's actually just R. Okay, then I've got my Coulomb parts. Okay, because the electro electrons are interacting with uh, the nuclei, and then I've got, again, this electron-electron interaction, which is just devastating to our ability to do this. Notice I'm using that R12 um, deal. Okay, um, now let me, let me write, oh, sorry, let, I, I, put, I put this in as a placeholder, sorry about that. Let me, let me put down what I really meant to write. Psi 1, R1, Psi 2, R2. 
and um, and this guy. Sorry, I just I was giving myself a placeholder because again, this this is so complicated to write out, and God knows. If I, hopefully, hopefully, I won't mess this up. Okay. Now again, remember how I talked about how these Slater determinants work. There's the diagonal parts that make sense. The first electrons in the first orbital, the second electrons in the second orbital, and, and yada 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 over here. Remember that R's are dummy or stupid uh, operators. They don't. They don't. They're not walls. They're not derivatives, right? Walls are uh, derivatives are painful. These are um, not so bad. All right, now that means that I can rearrange the wave functions, right? I can actually do this. I can put this one with this one and just, I can actually just put this over here, uh, because why not? And then I have all the operators. I, again, then I can hop this one over here and multiply it by that, and I end up with So um, I know it's a little bit, a bunch of squiggles and whatnot. But again, because uh, I don't have derivatives up here, I, what I've done is I've just rearranged the wave function. So I've got psi 1, r1 star um, time, you know, the absolute value. Now recall that this, a wave function doesn't mean anything. The wave function squared means something. This is the probability of where is that first electron these are a bunch of Coulomb operators, and this is where is the second electron. So this makes sense. This is where is number one, where is number two. Again, it's a very sensible thing. And then Coulomb operators that are there because they, they're electrons and they're interacting with stuff. Totally sensible. Okay, but because of that anti-symmetry thing, and we'll end here, um, we'll end here, take a 10 minute break. Uh, let me write down the the J part, and, and I won't I won't mess up. The, but I'll, I'll just write it out so I won't put a placeholder. Okay, so I got psi one r one star um, psi two r two star. So it starts out sensible. Here's all the operators, and then I've got psi one r two. Psi two r one. Actually, I guess these are just r squared dr anyway. Okay. Now remember, this, the diagonal terms of the wave functions in the determinant form are sensible because it basically gives me this and this for the Coulomb integrals, which these are just where the wave functions are, and I totally get that. We start out in the J interval because of the cross terms in the, in the wave functions and those determinants. The part that makes it anti-symmetric to interchange, it starts out looking okay, operators, but then I get this, where the coordinates are exchanged. R2 is now in, is now in, the, in the first electron space, and the first electron's in the second electron space. So it's like, you know, like I say the coordinates have switched. Now this is this is bizarre. Like, what does that mean? I don't know. I'm pretty sure that electrons don't just suddenly change position. Maybe they are. I really don't know. I don't think anyone knows. But we do know that two electrons can't be in the same spot at the same time. We know that anti-symmetric wave functions make that work. I know that this is basically like this is like the foil, right? So I've got a squared minus d squared, and this is the bc, uh, pl the plus two bc part of, of the foil, right? And when you're when you've got all these, yeah. Anyway, so uh, again, you can see why this is called the exchange. Now it tends to be positive, um, so it's usually. I can't give you platitudes at this point. I can't say it's always positive. I can't do that. These are way too complicated. There's no way to predict this except to just do them, especially when we're getting past H minus the helium. Okay, but it tends to be positive. It certainly contributes to the energy. And what it causes is it causes triplets to be lower in energy. And okay, what, what, real quick, real quick, let me show you why that matters. We still do our... Um, 
let's still do our hydrogen, okay? Our H minus. Ground state, single. Notice that, it, uh oh, well maybe the triplet's lower in energy, right? Because what, what I just said, what triplet? I can't make this a triplet, right? Because there's only one state. So most things are in singlet ground state because you, have, you don't have an opportunity to make a triplet. But if light comes along, um, light doesn't have spin angular momentum. So typically, you go to a first excited state. However, what can happen is that this configuration is lower in energy. So here's 2s, here's the 2p. Uh, because I did light, I, I felt the need to make this go to a p, uh, 2p state. 2p state. Okay. What can happen is this is lower in energy. Notice I tried to, I tried to, let me, let me just redo that. Um, I, I'm trying to draw this like, like lower, I've like lowered that, see how I did that? Um, that's a triplet state. It's lower in energy because that weird cross term in the wave function gives me this exchange part of the Coulomb interaction that lowers this energy. Again, I tried to, it's a little arbitrary, but I tried to draw that down. Now what that means is when light shines on organics, and this is mostly true of organics, they have some chance of ending up in the triplet wave state. And if that happens, they may interact with one of the few organics that exists in great abundance that's naturally triplet. What's that? Huh? Oxygen. Oxygen. Oxygen is naturally triplet. So, the thing about triplets are, triplets react with other triplets. They're like radicals. I mean, they, they have unpaired electrons. Triplets are like radicals. The triplets have to be radicals, basically, because they have unpaired electrons. If they're paired, then they're singlet. Oxygen is a weirdo because, uh, let's see here. Let's, let's construct the molecular orbital for O2 um, from the 2P. And oxygen, oxygen is, let's see, go carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, right? So that's four, five, six. So one, um, two, three, four, uh, six, but two are for the P states. Okay, the same for this one. Okay, when you construct the orbitals, uh, we get a bonding and antibonding. A bonding and antibonding. Uh, this would be from um, P's that look like this. And then I've got another two. And that would be from P's on the side. And, um, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't do that right. That's from this interaction, and that, and this other guy's from this interaction. Okay, so this is lower in energy. Okay, one, two, three, four. Um, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm messing up here. I just got, a, I got one ring. I got one of these, and I got two of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sorry about that. I just brain freeze. All right, there you go. Sorry, I'm just a mess. Friday, right? Okay, remember molecular orbitals you had in the freshman? Oxygen is naturally a triplet. If it runs into another triplet, it reacts like, a, like an atomic bomb, or more like an explosion, and it actually literally is an explosion, by the way. So, this is why things oxidize, right? Uh, because in the, when light shines on something, they may end up in the triplet states. Oxygen's a triplet, and bam up, it just reacts like that. And if you have any questions about that, what's remember carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, singlet, triplet, that no singlet. Oxygen is incredibly unusual. I mean, essential for life and all that, but oxygen is incredibly unusual for being a ground state triplet. Not many things do that. Um, 
nitrate, and so you, you hear the word oxidation. You don't hear of things nitriting to death because things tend to end up in the triplet state. Nitrogen is naturally singlet, so they don't react. So that's why you don't hear of things nitriting away. You hear them oxidizing. 